The Republic of Adyghir is in Russia's south. It's often referred to as the land of legends. Each mountain and each valley is said to have a story behind it. It's the land of the Adyg people, who still live in accordance with age-old traditions. They used to worship pagan gods, but also believed in Christ and Allah. Their written language is barely a hundred years old, but it takes three characters to symbolize some of its sounds. They still abduct brides here, and bridegrooms never meet their future wife's parents. The Adigs are one of the ancient peoples of the Caucasus. You can watch the way this family lives as if it were part of a never-ending reality show. Scores of tourists come here every day to see how indigenous Adigs live. From early morning, buses bring them here every two hours, group after group. Aisa, a 50-year-old teacher and head of the family, has set up a home museum. All the objects within it look just as they did in the old times. A pot, clay and silver crockery and traditional costumes. We don't call guests to our wedding. Usually we cook for 400 to 500 persons, but sometimes a thousand could come. The village where Asa lives is situated 100 kilometers from Sochi, the venue for the 2014 Winter Olympics. Tea plantations lie across the road from the large house. Visitors to the home museum are offered tea to start with. They follow every traditional rule. It's poured from a pot into the mug and then back again. The locals call this procedure marrying tea. For a better absorption, it needs to be enriched with oxygen. It is not married for the sake of witticism. This is done to make it more enjoyable. The creator of this home museum has little time for a snack between excursions. When he eats, he uses the household utensils that he was demonstrating to visitors only a few moments ago. Maybe you want some coffee or tea? Anything else, dear? No, thanks. I'm okay. Oh, that's okay. We get inspiration from these old plates and pots. We don't even know how old they are, perhaps many centuries. Naturally, we use them by the fireside. Adigs are the oldest community in the Caucasus. The Republic's flag features 12 stars to match the number of Adig tribes. Three arrows at the bottom symbolize bravery, courage, and humaneness. Historically, the Adigs never had prisons, police, or any other punitive institutions used by governments. They carefully followed the rules and laws that were molded into a special charter over the centuries. Offenders were morally censured by fellow tribesmen, and had to stay away from the community for some time. Today, the Adigs are scattered around the world. Adig diasporas can be found in Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, Britain, Germany, Canada, and New Zealand, a total of 35 countries. According to some reports, the Adig population now totals around 14 million. Maikop, the capital of the Republic of Adygea, is situated 1,500 kilometers south of Moscow. Maikop is called Apple Valley in the Adig language. Years ago, it may well have looked like an apple orchard, but today it's just an ordinary town. But the patriarchal character of age-old lifestyles is still very much in harmony with the rhythms of the 21st century. Even the Adigs living in the country's towns remain committed to their customs and traditions. Do it as your grandma does. When you grow up, you'll do it for your husband. He'll love you very much. Shortly before Sunday lunch, 
Natusha Dacheva's entire family gets together in the kitchen. The grandmother teaches her grandchildren to cook a traditional dish. It is called khalush, deep-fried flat pasties filled with cheese. Roll it like this. It looks like a TV cookery show. For Adigs, such preparations for Sunday lunch are a matter of routine. Children are taught to value traditions from early childhood, and young people wear traditional dress during family celebrations. Adig women are known for their beauty and for their simple but exquisite dresses. These costumes have the nickname poetical dresses. Now it has a modern look, but earlier it was made with such beautiful brushes. And the bride was wearing it. This dance tells the story of a girl and a young man on their first rendezvous. After a period of courtship, the young man has to abduct his future wife, according to tradition. In family life, the woman stays in the man's shadow, although on some occasions, they do manage to emerge from the shadows. A case in point is Sarah Zakhachova, it's hard to imagine now that 30 years ago, this Adig woman wore business suits and went to Moscow every six months to attend Soviet Congresses of the People's Deputies. Sarah was the only female member of parliament in Adigia. It was the first session, the first time that I went there. Sarah's political career did nothing to change her lifestyle. Between her trips to Moscow, she worked as a dairymaid, something she had been doing before becoming a member of parliament. Each day after work, she made Adig cheese, which is renowned throughout Russia and the world. And she always produced a lot of cheese. When there's a lot of milk, we hand the cheese out to relatives and sell it. Nor did Sarah's social status have any effect on the relationships between members of her family. Indeed, when she returned home after work one day, her future husband abducted her, in line with Adig tradition. They didn't let her to marry then, so I had to steal her. Sarah's son abducted his fiancée too, and brought her into the house where he was living with his parents. Later, he built a home of his own nearby. Several months ago, Sarah's granddaughter was abducted. Since then, they've rarely seen her. As for her husband, they're unlikely to see him at all. In accordance with an old Adig custom, a bridegroom is not supposed to meet the bride's parents under any circumstances. Kamil, Sarah's husband, never saw his mother or father-in-law. If we were to meet at all, I wouldn't be able to put in a word. Although Adigs are not supposed to get to know their wives' parents, knowing their family tree is a must. Hello, my dear. How are you doing? Hello. <laughs> Ahmed Talishev, a wood-carving craftsman, has traced his genealogy back to the 19th century. The local museum features his ancestors. After the end of the Caucasian War in 1864, one of Ahmed's great-grandfathers, Prince Talisha, met with Russian Emperor Alexander II. He represented half of Circassia. That historical person was at the root of our family name and bloodline. Ahmed is a celebrity by local standards. He's regarded as the best woodcarver in the Republic. He makes cradles for babies based upon old sketches. It takes a couple of days for Ahmed to make the simplest cradle, consisting of 12 parts. The most sophisticated one takes a week. It has 130 parts, but doesn't contain a single nail. Each cradle bears a religious sign. That's how the addicts ask God to protect their babies. Ahmed's cradles are inherited or presented to close friends. 
I think more than a hundred people grew up in my cradles. I have to reject some orders because I have a lack of time. At bedtime, addicts perform a special ritual. Be happy, my sweet girl. May nothing disturb your dreams. May your sleep be as sound as that of a kitten. In accordance with the rules, the oldest woman in the house puts the child to bed. All of the neighbors come to witness the ritual and take part in it. Boiled eggs are placed on a shelf next to the bed to ward off voodoo. It is believed that the shell of the eggs will crack if a bad person enters the house. Chunks of molded dough are buried close to the house a few weeks after the birth of a child. Dig here, please. Let all diseases and griefs go away. Our fathers and grandfathers used to bury it like that. And now we too perform this ritual whenever a baby is born. The children's bedtime ritual culminates with a lullaby, and all the women who happen to be at home join in. This rite was performed to encourage fine weather. Gracious God! Gracious God! Give wealth and prosperity to our land. Give wealth and prosperity to our land. Now, though, it's just theater. Most of the people living here are now Muslims. But contrary to religious belief, they do eat pork and drink alcohol and their women never wear the yashmak. The addicts have experienced three dominant religions during their history, paganism, Christianity, and Islam. But none of them explains why these table stones, as they're known, appeared in Adigia. The area has the world's largest collection of ancient stone block buildings. Table stones are similar to stone houses, but their purpose is still largely unclear. If I start to tell you about it, you'll be here until the morning. There's a table stone in Shamset Bose's courtyard. She says scientists have several versions suggesting its origin. Some say they are burial structures. Others call them ancient sanctuaries. And there's also the belief that they represent chronological capsules containing messages given to posterity. Shamsat sees nothing magical in this stone structure. As a matter of fact, until recently, she used its roof to let her maize dry out in the sun. We've lived side by side with this table stone for several decades. We think the table stone and the house are a single whole. Of course, we keep it in order, but then in general, we keep our courtyard in order. Abdullah Bersirov sets out on a trip to the mountains to make sketches for another painting. He wants to paint a mountain called Shigosh. Translated from the Adig language, it means giving birth to the clouds. The mountain lives up to its name. A few minutes later, clouds envelop the gorge. Abdullah finishes the drawing from memory and signs it using Russian letters. The sophisticated Adig language, containing 66 sounds, was committed to paper in the mid-19th century. Arabic characters served as the letters, but the Soviet government changed the alphabet. In the 1920s, the Adig language was scripted in Latin characters, and in the 1930s, in Cyrillic. Some of the sounds required three characters each. 
ج ش ج ح That is how the written language of the Adig became the world's youngest. It was at that time that some of the words contained as many as 48 characters. Language and script need to be in harmony. If you have to use many characters to denote one sound, then this creates a problem for any language, especially in the Adig language. After work, Abdullah attends a rehearsal. Hello. The celebrated local ensemble, Zhu, practice in the house belonging to its leader, Zamudin Guchev. In accordance with local etiquette, ensemble members take seats in line with their age, even during rehearsals. Now, as the oldest man here, Abdullah takes a seat at center stage. Zaur and Erhan take seats on both sides of the elder. Zamudin has made every instrument the band uses. He makes musical instruments in his workshop based on old samples. From time immemorial, Adigs drew on natural materials to make instruments, such as pumpkin and tubular plants. Look at this pumpkin. A brief tour of the inner sanctum, Zamudin's workshop. This is the place where the instruments are born. This one is called the Shishep Shin, the first violin of the band. From front part, it looks like dagger, and uh, from the side, it looks like boat. The Shichepshin and Adigs go hand in hand throughout their lifetime. Lullabies, weddings and funerals, all are accompanied by this instrument. It takes several months to make a Shichepshin. <laughs> Making the strings is one of the most difficult phases of the process. They are made from very specific horsehair. They take hair from the tail of stud horse, and it must be hybrid. One of the ensemble soloists, Erhan, came to Adigia from Turkey, where he was born and lived with his relatives. Erhan is Adig by nationality. He came to see his motherland and decided to stay here forever. I signed up for the ensemble almost as soon as I learned about its existence. I wanted to learn about the culture of my people by keeping in touch with it. Erhan says that most of the addicts living abroad look forward to returning to their historical homeland. Erhan has been here now for four years. When he came here with the intention of entering university, he didn't know a word of Russian or Adig. I'm an Adig, and I wanted to study here more than anywhere else. I simply wanted to take a look at my homeland, feel and understand it. This is where a good education comes in handy. At the beginning, I had hard times trying to learn two unfamiliar languages at the same time. Asya Yuti is a blacksmith. She was one of the few women here to breach the bans imposed by its patriarchal society. She's the first woman gunsmith in the Northern Caucasus. Despite her hard job in the smithy, Asya retains her gentle femininity. Here you are, my sunshine. What are you doing? Don't burn your fingers. 
Asya learned the secrets of metalwork before she learned to read. Her grandfather was a jeweler, so it's little wonder she played with tools rather than dolls. Asya has since turned her hand to making arms, hundreds of goblets, belts and pendants. Take a look at this edge. I think it needs the file. Certainly. Hold it. Following an exhibition of the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, Asya's works were brought by museums in Istanbul, New York and Moscow. But Asya is the exception. For most addicts, following tradition is a lifestyle. Listen, I leave the way my grandfather taught me. If you want to, you can leave the way I do. A new group of tourists is visiting Aisa Achmizov's home museum. A digger attracts people with its unraveled mysteries. Here, an age-old history is whimsically intertwined with signs of modern life. Oriental mentality with Western lifestyles and Muslim culture coupled with Christian values and the vestiges of pagan rites.